Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to this, the May 2024 edition of the European Urology Podcast. My name is Declan Murphy, urologist here at Peter McCallum Cancer Centre in Melbourne. I'm speaking to you from here in the GU Cast studio, and in this edition, we are going to be whizzing around the world to catch up on some of the big highlights in this month's edition of European Urology. We're going to be crossing to Rome and Cleveland to discuss a randomized control trial of open versus robotic cystectomy. Then it's off to Aberdeen to learn about the Pioneer Project, a paper from which is published in this month's journal, all about using big data to look at some interesting prostate cancer variables in these huge data sets. Finally then, over to Mexico to speak to one of our senior trainees about what else caught his eye in this month's edition of the European Urology Journal. So let's get going. So for our first highlight paper in this month's European Urology podcast, uh, it's uh, very exciting to introduce this randomized control trial of open versus uh, robotic cystectomy uh, from Roma. And it's uh, a great privilege to welcome uh, senior author Giuseppe Simone, a urologist. He's the chief of urology at the Regina Elena National Cancer Institute in Rome, who's going to talk a bit about the paper. And also to welcome uh, Dr. Laura Bucavina, uh, Laura, who is one of our associate editors at European Urology, um, she's a urologist and the Translational Research Director at the Cleveland Clinic uh, Foundation in Cleveland. Um, Giuseppe and Laura, welcome and thank you very much for joining us on the European Urology Podcast. Thank you for Thanks having for us. So uh, this is a great paper. We'll put the links in the show notes. Um, we're not going to dive into the whole detail of the paper. We encourage people to go and look that up themselves. But Giuseppe, could we start off by asking you to briefly summarize this randomized trial of ro robot versus open cystectomy, why it's a bit different to other trials that have been done in this setting, uh, and your findings? Yeah, at the time of uh, enrollment, um, we had a previous randomized control of the trials comparing open with robotic cystectomy performing extracorporeal urinary diversion. So at that time, we wanted to figure out how intracorporeal diversion would impact on uh, the outcomes of this complex and challenging surgery. Uh, this is a single center trial uh, with two established surgical teams performing open and robotic procedures uh, independently, uh, both surgical team with a high volume uh, either in open or robotic procedures. So at that time, we were comparing the best uh, available in our institution. Uh, we uh, designed a clinical trial uh, setting the primary endpoint at a 50% reduction of perioperative transfusion rate. Based on this primary endpoint, uh, we enrolled 58 patients per arm uh, with the idea of having half reduction uh, of transfusion rate in robotic arm. Uh, with this primary endpoint, the trial was successful. Um, we were aware that uh, perioperative transfusion and estimated blood loss uh, were lower with robotic surgery. We had some data from previous trials, uh, but at the same time, we didn't want to uh, have different and more challenging endpoints because the risk was to be uh, enrolling patients, hundreds and hundreds of patients for a long time uh, and to miss the goal of the trial. So uh, we are aware that a uh, reduction of perioperative transfusion rate is not uh, a big uh, endpoint as oncologic outcomes, but we were aware that the Razor trial previously supported uh, robotic procedures as a non-inferior uh, procedure compared to open surgery in terms of cancer control. So the point is, uh, what about intracorporeal versus extracorporeal diversion? Uh, another specific point of our trial is that uh, a significant proportion of patients received orthotopic diversion. This is very important because other trials have a significant amount of patients receiving uh, iliac conduit uh, versus orthotopic diversion. And you know that uh, complications are mostly driven by diversion itself than by robotic cystectomy or open cystectomy. So these are the strains of our trial. Uh, and uh, to be honest, we didn't find any significant difference in terms of, of secondary outcomes, perioperative complications, readmissions, oncological outcomes. Uh, and of course, we had higher costs with robotic procedures as worldwide, I would say. 
uh, and these are the data and anyone should look at the data uh, deep in the results section and uh, itself, you know, to understand uh, what's the best way to proceed in uh, his institution. Well, congratulations. A randomized control trial, always a worthy thing and certainly worthy of this, uh, the highest ranked journal in urology. Uh, Laura, I'll hand over to you to lead the discussion. Your thoughts on this randomized trials, they usually change practice, especially if it's a positive endpoint. Uh, what's your take on it? I have to agree with you, Declan. Surgical prospective trials are, are incredibly difficult to do. I think it's much more difficult than anything else within medical oncology. I have to look behind my shoulder, but <laughs> it's very difficult to, to convince patients to be randomized to a surgery, right? Yep. They have to really trust their surgeon for them to be able to do this job. So Giuseppe, congratulations to you and your team. Now, I have to I have a disclaimer. I come from Cleveland Clinic, the robotic surgery capital of the world, right? But I have to tell you that an open cystectomy, in, at least in this paper and the two other papers from Cato and the RAZO trial, it clearly doesn't show that open cystectomy is superior. It also doesn't show that the robotic is superior, sort of equivalent in terms of outcomes, as you mentioned. However, it seems like we're pushing and keep pushing everyone, including our residents and our trainees, to continue to learn robotic cystectomy whether and the diversions without really noticing the fact that many of our trainees are no longer able to do an open mm. surgery. Yeah. What's your thoughts on that, considering there's no benefits to doing robotic cystectomy? Uh, this is a big point. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, to be honest, uh, I am not a, a definitive answer to this question. Um, from my perspective, uh, it's very hard to have uh, in an institution, except for some uh, very high volume institutions, two different programs working parallel with open and robotic surgery. Uh, I mean, uh, this is a, a procedures that have that has a high incidence of perioperative complications, and we know from literature that uh, surgical volume is crucial to uh, drop down the perioperative complications. So, if uh, you do two parallel programs, one with open, one with robotic, there is a risk of performing yearly uh, five uh, neobladder with open surgery and five neobladders with robotic surgery. Uh, and this is a surgery that, from my standpoint, should be standardized day by day to make it easier, uh, not only for the surgeons, but also for bedside assistant, for nurse, for OR staff, for everyone. So if we want to go towards improved outcomes, we need to standardize day by day the procedure and do every day the same job. That's the point, and uh, that's the reason why in our institution, uh, immediately after the trial, uh, Despite the results, uh, we, we are no longer performing open surgery and the entire program is going for robotic procedure. Oh, wow. Do you, do you think it's paralyzing to someone who's never done a robotic, who's never done an open cystectomy to do a robotic cystectomy in case there is a complication and you do need to open? Yeah, very important. And the, it, it, this question uh, moved me back to the question about the training. So uh, any institution should have some surgeons able to perform open surgery, uh, able to work uh, when robot is not available, able to train young physicians uh, to learn uh, key steps of open procedures. Uh, but if you look at the future, I'm pretty sure uh, by 10 years, no one will be able to teach open surgery uh, in US as well as in Europe. So uh, it's very hard to figure out how we should balance between learning uh, either open or uh, robotic procedures. I think it's a true privilege uh, for me uh, to have had the opportunity to learn uh, open lab and robotic surgery at the same time. One other thing that I was surprised, Giuseppe, is it can, one of the benefits that I see, and I have, you know, I'm I'm both open and robotic surgeon, depending on the availability of the robot is that I'm actually preferentially do like to do intracorporeal neobladders with robot because of the dissection and the urethral length. I was surprised that your open neobladders actually had better nighttime continence than your robotic. So that was sort of, you know, it's a little, it's different than what we think of usually, right? So I'm curious what you think of the findings yourself. 
Yeah, of course. Uh, <clears throat> I thought a lot about this point, uh, and I have two possible explanations. The first one is about uh, the shape and the volume of the neobladder. So my feeling is that when we do uh, open neobladder, uh, we tend to do larger uh, neobladder than uh, we usually do for uh, robotic procedures. This is because when you are doing robotic neobladder, uh, time is important. Uh, so you want to, to keep uh, as fast as possible to avoid uh, uh, too much long surgical procedure. This is the first uh, potential explanation for this. The second one uh, was the uh, observation that we had improved uh, nighttime continence uh, in female patients. And that's the reason why immediately after the trial, uh, we stopped removing the specimen through the vagina. So we are uh, performing a small uh, prepubic incision to avoid uh, specimen extraction through the vagina in all female patients that are scheduled to receive the neobladder. Absolutely. Jennifer, one last question we have is obviously the elephant in the room, and that's the cost, the cost associated with robotic surgery, not only in terms of the duration in the operating room and time per time per minutes in the OR, or golden minutes as we call them, but also the equipment. Um, how do you rationalize no benefit to surgery, but also higher cost to surgery? Yeah, uh, the issue of costs, uh, especially in Italy, was a big issue for uh, robotic surgery. Uh, now it's improving because the uh, costs of robotic uh, supplies are going down. Uh, and uh, we are now uh, facing an era where multiple robotic platforms will be available uh, and hopefully costs will still go down. Uh, in the near future. Uh, to be honest, um, we need to face uh, robotic surgery and its cost as a reality. So patients are uh, asking for minimal invasive and robotic procedure. And you know, uh, our discussion would be very different, very hard to be translated to a patient that is looking for a neobladder with intent of preserving sexual function. So patients are reading uh, through the website uh, and you know Google uh, that you know with robotic surgery you may have improved uh, preservation of sexual function, lower estimated blood cost. So uh, basically, uh, costs issues uh, are something that patients uh, are unlikely to hear. They want to have the best available, and you know it's very hard to convince patients that we have no data to. Uh, support robotic as uh, a best procedure today. Yeah, it really goes with the marketing of the technique, right? So a lot of the hospitals use the minimally invasive, even though there's no data to target to patients and market to patients. And then it's hard to convince patients otherwise that there is actually no benefit. So I understand where Absolutely. you're coming from. Absolutely. And this is exactly the same for uh, prostatectomy. So there is no one in Italy today that would like to receive an open retropubic prostatectomy, but you know, literature <laughs> is not supporting robotic as the best option, but you know, no one would have open retropubic prostatectomy. Declan, do I have one, one last question and you can cut it out if you for don't sure. like it. I'm just, I, I'm, I'm, I apologize, apologize already for cutting the two of you off. I'm really enjoying this discussion, but yeah, please go. So Giuseppe, one of the things, and when I looked at the paper too, is, you know, your surgeons were doing 50 or more cases a year. That's a designation for a high volume center, right? Sure. Majority of centers within the United States and the world are not doing, most surgeons are not doing 50 cystectomies a year. I think on average, even if you have a high volume center, they're doing maybe 20 to 30 a year. So the data that you have presented here is probably the best of the best. Do you think if someone was to look at potentially data that doesn't fit this 50 criteria, would you have the same results? Or do you think the robot perhaps would do better or worse? Yeah, uh, you know, uh, it's very important to centralize these challenging procedures uh, to achieve improved outcomes thanks to a higher surgical volume. Uh, and in Italy as well, there are not so many centers with a significant high volume uh, case load, uh, especially for uh, cystectomy. That's the reason why uh, we previously discussed about the opportunity to focus on a program. 
to avoid that, we have 10 different surgeons performing either open or robotic cystectomy. That would finally mean that any single surgeon would do one, two neobladder per year. So in that specific scenario, it's very hard to foresee uh, better outcomes than uh, we reported in the trial. So very important to keep attention on high volume standardization of procedures, dedicated surgeon on that specific program. Uh, this is a challenging surgery and we need to have uh, the best every day at the table. Terrific. I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. We're all cheers here, here. Um, and congratulations again, Giuseppe, to you and your team at the National Cancer Institute in Rome. Uh, for this piece of work. And thank you very much to Laura for joining us. Um, lots there to chew on. I think the thing that's ringing in my ears, having listened to their discussion, is about the open surgery. Where, who's going to do the open surgery in 10 years' time? It's a, uh, it's a topic we're going to discuss on GUCast, our other podcast, uh, in the next month or two uh, as we try and address this. And I must say, we discussed this at um, the USANS, the Urology Society meeting in Australia recently, where I was debating, uh, trying to defend the role of open surgery. And, and I sort of postulated that it will be the cancer centres that will still have a cohort of people who can do open surgery, retroperitoneal, cystectomy. But listening to Giuseppe and Laura, I'm wondering, will that really be the case in many countries in 10 years time uh, and all buggers like me will have long left uh, the department so um, challenges ahead but thank you so much for that excellent discussion and congratulations again so for our second paper this month uh, I'm very pleased to see this in press it is the first really big paper from the Pioneer Project, which we'll explain all about in a second. Um, the, certainly the first paper from the Pioneer Project addressing a specific important research question uh, in urology. So what is the Pioneer Project and what is this huge number of pa patients that they've analysed from a prostate cancer perspective and published in this month's European Urology? Well, I'm really pleased to say I'm joined by uh, my friend, Professor James Endow, um, Professor of Urology at the University of Aberdeen and also Adjunct Secretary General of the EAU looking after education. And James is the senior author on this pioneer paper published in this month's European Urology. James, um, welcome and thank you for joining the European Urology podcast. Uh, Declan, it's a real pleasure. Uh, actually, it's an honour to, to be on this with you. Um, since I know it's a ridiculously early time for you, um, honoured that you, you took the time. So a pleasure, really. To, to be on. Terrific. Well, look, thank you very much, James. And look, this is a very interesting project and a very interesting paper. But before we dive into the detail of this one, and by the way, folks, the details, of course, are in the main manuscript in European Urology. We'll be putting a link in the show notes. So please dive in there to get more detail. The title of it is Clinical Characterization of Patients Diagnosed with Prostate Cancer and Undergoing Conservative Management, uh, an analysis from the Pioneer Project based on big data. So before we dive into it, James, can you just tell us what is this Pioneer Project? Um, I have to say from attending the EAU meeting in recent years, Pioneer often comes up as a, a huge initiative that's being explored by the EAU with a large number of partners. So can you tell us what, what is the Pioneer Project? So this is a big data for better outcomes project, um, a consortium started 2018, a consortium of um, 32 partners from across nine countries. Uh, five years on, we have about 37 full partners of the consortium. It's a public private partnership Declan, that the European Commission um, started a few years ago where they encourage academic centers, um, patients, um, patient advocacy groups, small and medium sized enterprises and the pharmaceutical industry to come together and try and address unmet needs. And, and they put a call out um, about 2016 uh, for, for this particular project. And it was quite timely actually. So it's a neutral platform. Um, funded by the European Commission's Innovative Medicines Initiative, uh, the IMI. Um, they gave us 12 million um, over five years, 12 million euro. And for the EAU, this was the first step that the guidelines offers that on behalf of the EAU led this consortium, stepped away from traditional evidence synthesis to explore the complementarity of big data to help fix the gaps that we haven't been able to fix in terms of randomized trials. And that's how this all started. 
Yeah, very interesting. So we all know there's lots of data out there in healthcare, but often locked away in either different institutions, different countries, different administrative data sets. And it was as the era of big data was coming along and people had the ability to crunch large bits of data, but it requires, in this instance, overcoming geographic boundaries, political boundaries, financial challenges, technical challenges to analyze the big data, uh, but a very ambitious project. And it is exciting to see this particular paper, James, um, looking at, did I read this correctly? How many hundreds of millions of patients were uh, analyzed in this before coming up with like half a million uh, odd um, uh, prostate cancer patients and diving down into a, a group of them that had conservative management. So uh, tell us a bit about that and, and what the main findings from this particular element of the Pioneer Project were. Certainly. Well, let me start, Declan, by saying that although I may be listed as a senior author on this paper, the the one person that deserves a huge amount of credit is the first author, um, Giorgio Gandaghi, who is uh, from San Rafael in Milan. As you know, he, he won the Matula Award in Paris recently and a, a, a super smart young urologist, <clears throat> incredibly talented. And um, he's obviously very well trained in traditional evidence synthesis. And what really has impressed us in this first um, research question that was being answered, we had 56 prioritized research questions that was prioritized across patients and clinicians, including oncologists, as well as, um, uh, as, well as other stakeholders, including FDA partners, pharmaceutical industry. But we chose this one, one of the top five prioritized research questions, because Declan, this was really a pilot for us, a pilot to learn how to um, work with large data sets, right? You and I are used to randomized trials. I spent so many years in Cochrane and doing randomized trials that are non-commercial, uh, multi-center in the UK, but this was the first time we're actually coming into this arena where you're faced with millions of, of prostate cancer patients, but all um, already existing as secondary data, right? Either in registries, um, prospective um, population-based registries, or as you know, insurance claims data. And that's where the huge volume really comes from. Uh, but for, for us, this question was about choosing one that will test us. Because conservative management, how do you, and that includes both watchful waiting and of course, active surveillance, how do you retrospectively in records, knowing how badly we clinicians document what we do and why we do it, how do you separate those that are for watchful waiting from those that, that the intent was active surveillance? And we learned a lot about how to actually develop a protocol. So there's a huge amount of work that had to go on in terms of developing the protocol, converting the data to what we call an OMA common data model, to ensure consistent representation of clinical terms across multiple coding systems and allowing therefore for federated uh, analytics. And we then had to go on and develop a core analytic package that is used uniformly across all of the uh, data sets. Aggregated results are then shared back to us and the usual traditional uh, statistical methods that you and I know well, kaplan my analysis used to estimate, for example, um, time to event data, time to survival, treatment initiation, symptomatic progression, hospitalization, and emergency department visits. And, and we were able to, in terms of the headlines, um, reliably report on expected comorbidities, especially for patients at that age, right? Where, you know, patients in their late 60s, 70s, or 80s, where hypertension, obesity, and diabetes, type 2 diabetes were common. And it was nice to be able to say, well, looking across eight data sets, there was consistency in us being able to find such things when we looked for them, right? The other thing that we, we quite uh, uh, were interested in seeing was that we could see the risk of curative and palliative interventions decreasing over time. Um, prostate cancer-related symptoms, and progression, hospitalization, emergency department uh, visits, all decreased consistently over time across the eight data sets. 
And these were not rocket science, but they were important um, findings to allow us to beef up our counseling when we talk to patients. So they, they but, but really, Declan, the headline was, we were learning. We were learning how to do what needed to be done in a, in a methodologically sound way in a real world arena. And um, the limitations of this, of course, include the fact that these are administrative data sets, so we don't have the granularity we have in electronic health records, and that's all very de well dealt with in the paper. But a question I had for you is, could you take this same idea of having big data analysis and crunching through huge numbers of patients, huge numbers of data points, and apply it to electronic health records in, in, you know, in future environments where hospitals all have electronic health records, maybe many of them have records from one or two big providers and and is it possible do you think for this same methodology the same platform you've developed to go into electronic health records in huge numbers if you broke down the barriers and get even more detail absolutely uh, there's absolutely no reason why and it's been done before if you look at what's been done in covid and many other disease areas beyond urology that the, the analytical packages we've developed, once you've mapped the data set to the common data model, OMAP, you can actually run that package, either if you have the data set copy centrally um, or federated sitting behind your own hospital firewall, you can run that same package. So not only can we go back and update the results based on the eight, eight data sets we first worked with, but actually we can add new data sets um, and run the same package and expand it, including electronic health records. And bear in mind, Declan, that some of the data sets were not claims, right? So some of them were claims data sets, but some were not. Um, but if you look at now the Pioneer platform, we have what, 44 data sets available with over three and a half million prostate cancer patients, 31 looking at clinical parameters, the other 13 looking at imaging um, omics and PROMs. Uh, out of that, uh, out of that uh, 31, uh, you find that 13 are actually central. This was an, a fascinating thing we learned that even though 18 were federated, i.e., you hang on to your own map data behind your firewall. Over time, with with researchers and academic centers gaining trust in the consortium and what we stood for, 13 have shared actually their data centrally, sitting on the Pioneer platform. Um, uh, in Helmholtz, including big centers that you know of, like Martina Clinic, ERSPC um, uh, in Rotterdam, Diamond in Cambridge, the Malmo data sets, Florence, Milan, Hong Kong, Dresden, Freiburg, a number of centers, which was something we did not expect. We expected, as you and I would have suspected, that people will just want to keep hold of their data in their federated environment. But things have moved on in a positive way. And maybe that'll be part of the legacy of the Pioneer Project is breaking down those barriers and it's an ongoing uh, initiative. And can you finally let us know what else we might expect out of Pioneer in, in the coming year or two, uh, James? Anything else we can look forward to? So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think this is just the beginning. There are other two study a -thons that we've done, which you will see uh, hopefully publications coming out of that. But what we've, what we've learned, Declan, has determined our next few steps for the next generation. And that is, despite huge volumes of data available in terms of secondary data sets, retrospective data sets, there were critical things missing. For example, robust disease stratification at the time of diagnosis being available in, in the data sets. The lack of prospectively collected from uh, patient experience of care measures, quality of life collected over time. Uh, and, and these are things that now, now Pioneer has evolved into Pioneer Plus in the sustainability phase. It is part of a broader EAU uh, big data or data initiative called the Euro Evidence Hub, where we, we have built now a prospective registry platform that is linked onto the Pioneer platform, but we collect data based on informed consent, directly uh, collect data directly from patients then entering data directly onto the platform. And we start piloting hopefully in Spain and Netherlands soon. They've got ethics approval in those, in those countries. So these are things that you will see happening because we must ad address the lack of diversity 
and the limitations in the data set that we found in the retrospective data, albeit large quantities. So a huge, exciting future. And this is definitely not for you and I, right? We're of an era where our time for, for these things have gone, right? This is for the next generation. So I may not live to see the real amazing things that these young ones like Giorgio, and we've got many like him that have come on board, the amazing things they can do. But it's our duty to, to get these foundations put in place. So hopefully you and I will be talking about these young ones and what they're doing in the coming months and years. Well, that's great to hear. Uh, James, congratulations again to you and all the team involved in Pioneer, uh, especially young Giorgio. I don't know how he gets the time to do all of this. Now we know he can analyze millions and <laughs> no millions idea. of patients. Yeah, Brigenti and Montorzi will be whipping him to do even more. Um, exactly. A super talented team. Congratulations to everyone involved in this. And yeah, the links are in the show notes. I encourage you to have a look at it and watch out for uh, presentations coming on Pioneer over the coming years. It's a real glimpse into a way forward for, to see how we can improve um, gaps in knowledge by using huge, huge data sets. And it takes gigantic multinational organizations like the EAU and funding from EU to do that. And of course, this is not just an European project. Um, uh, this is also looking at data sets outside Europe, which is very exciting, especially when we look at low and middle income countries as they develop better data sets, we should be able to go in there and look at the unmet needs as well. So um, James, again, thank you very much for joining us and congratulations to you and everyone involved in this project. Declan, thank you ever so much and congratulations for an amazing program, this GU cast that you looked amazing. The other segment we very much enjoy doing on the European Urology podcast, apart from our two big highlight papers, is to call one of our senior trainees who will tell us a bit about what else caught his or her eye in the journal this month. So it's a great uh, privilege to welcome uh, someone who I know uh, who visited me here in Melbourne. Uh, Carlos Delgado is a urology fellow at the National Cancer Institute in Mexico City. And uh, last year, Carlos came down here and spent a few months with us uh, on an observership. And he's coming back next year to Peter McCallum Cancer Center uh, as a fellow uh, following his current position in Mexico City. So Carlos is a very uh, keen uh, academic and he was very and he's a keen podcast fan so he was keen to join us on this segment of the podcast um carlos welcome and thank you for joining the european urology podcast good morning declan thanks for the invitation it's an honor to be here great good to see you and uh we have asked you to look at what else caught your eye apart from the two papers we've already highlighted in the journal this month uh, but before we get to that uh, tell us a bit about yourself you're speaking to us from uh, from mexico city Correct. I'm currently doing a, a fellowship here in urologic oncology. Uh, I'm in the National Cancer Institute in Mexico City, which is the largest uh, cancer center here in Mexico. So um, I, I'm very interested in in everything about prostate cancer specifically, yeah. and I I really enjoyed the time at Melbourne. And I know you are uh, also quite involved in a lot of EAU structures. The EAU has big tentacles that reaches all around the world now. And I recall when you were down here with us, you had just been or were heading to the Europe uh, meeting um, and the EAU guidelines, I know you say, uh, are very well read in Mexico as well. Um, so uh, it's great to have you involved in this particular EAU podcast. Correct. I'm a big fan of the EAU podcast. And I loved also to, to watch the GeoCast as well. Fantastic. Great to see you, my friend. So tell us, um, tell us about the, the three other papers that caught your eye this month. So the first paper is from the surgery in motion section, which is actually one of my favorites uh, from the journal. Uh, the title is Single Port Transvesical Robot Assisted Simple Prostatectomy, Surgical Technique and Clinical Outcomes. This study describes a novel approach for the surgical management of large BPH glands using a single port robotic system. Actually, first author is also Mexican. Uh, she's Dr. Roxana Ramos. She reported on 117 cases, highlighting the procedure's feasibility, safety, and effectiveness. All the patients had a minimum prostate volume of 80 milliliters. Key outcomes included minimal blood loss, low complication rates, and significant improvement in urinary function. At one year follow-up, median IPSS score improved 21 points, and median flow rate was 16 milliliters per second. I found very impressive that most of the patients were discharged within the first 24 hours, with, within, with a median length of a stay of five hours and 0% transfusion rate. 
one thing we are afraid of when doing a HOLEP or any other endoscopic enucleation technique is that the patients can develop urethral stricter or bladder neck contracture. No single patient had this complication with the single port technique described by Dr. Kayuk. Authors also mentioned this was attributed to the 360 degree bladder mucosal flap reconstruction described in the paper. Surgeries were performed by two expert single port surgeons. So further studies should aim to evaluate if these results can be reproduced by less experienced surgeons and, and at a larger scale. I guess the dispute between HOLEP and robotic surgeons will continue in, in the following years. And hopefully we will see uh, in the future uh, randomized control trials uh, comparing both procedures. And look, like a, a lot of things in surgery, Carlos, uh, if a surgeon has particular expertise and volume in one technique like HOLEP or in single port robotic in, uh, transvesicle, uh, they are going to achieve very good outcomes, we hope. I suppose the challenge is for uh, the rest of the community is uh, if you have both techniques available, which one should you be going for to develop your expertise in? And I think the reassuring data out of this experience is extraordinary, but it's from a super high volume, very experienced team and, um, right. and congrats to them. And of course, a lovely video going along with this. That's what surgery in motion is all about. Uh, so please go and have a look at that. We've put a link in the show notes. Um, I agree. That was a great one to highlight. Uh, what else caught your eye? Well, Declan, I'm sure the second paper caught your attention as well, because it, com it combines both uh, of your favorite topics, which is uh, lymph node management in prostate cancer and nuclear medicine in prostate cancer. <laughs> so, so this paper uh, I want to highlight is titled Robot Assisted Single Photo Emission Computed Tomography, Integrating Nuclear Medicine in Robotic Urologic Surgery. This research letter presents a novel concept of freehand intra-abdominal imaging called Robot Assisted Aspect. Authors describe the use of Sentinel node only procedure in five patients with high risk prostate cancer. Five hours before surgery, a radiated tracer is injected in the prostate for surgical guidance. A non-invasive SPECT scan is done to guide the surgeon to identify the target location. And during surgery, sentinel nodes were identified using fluorescence imaging and traced with a gamma probe. The initial results from five patients showed successful identification of sentinel nodes with high accuracy demonstrating the potential of this technology to enhance surgical decision-making. I suggest everyone to go and watch the supplementary video shared in the paper. It's absolutely amazing. I think that further research is needed to prove the clinical utility of these kind of robotic platforms, but I'm sure we'll see more of this in the future. Lovely work. It's a research letter. It's a short format drawing our attention to an emerging area of interest. And uh, yeah, because where are we with pelvic lymph node dissection? Uh, EAU this year was very interesting. Um, I did a plenary arguing against it. I said the, the tide is changing. The sun is setting on lymph node dissection at least in the traditional nomogram driven widespread um, use of lymph node dissection. Um, but clearly there is some role. And I think probably this type of radio guided surgery or imaging guided surgery, um, sentinel type, whatever, a better approach than widespread nomogram driven surgery, maybe the future. So beautiful paper and uh, please go and look it up. Uh, and you have one more, I think for us, Carlos. Correct. The third paper is titled MRI Evaluation of Prostate Gland After Focal Therapy for Prostate Cancer. It is the target consensus recommendations. Uh, it provides a comprehensive review and consensus on the optimal use of MRI for follow-up after focal therapy. The authors synthesized data from more than 70 studies to develop evidence-based recommendations aiming to standardize MRI protocols globally. Key recommendations include performing routine MRI at 12 months post-treatment using a multi-parametric protocol compliant with PIRATS version 2.1 standards and avoiding using PIRATS score uh, for treated tissue. Instead, authors recommend using an alternative five-point scoring system that includes a dynamic contrast-enhanced sequence, T2, and diffusion-weighted imaging. Treatment-induced necrosis and inflammation can mask recurrent disease if MRI is performed earlier than 12 months. Also, an early PSA after focal therapy can be hard to read, but it tends to stabilize at 12 months. So it seems that 12-month point 
is a good chance to assess MRI and PSA together, minimizing treatment artifacts. These guidelines are crucial for improving patient outcomes by detecting, detecting uh, treatment failures on time and providing a more uniform way to report prostate MRI after focal therapy. Validation studies are now needed to start incorporating this score into our clinical practice. Excellent. This will be very welcome by the focal therapy community. I know, Carlos, because interpretation of MR and which time point has always been an area of some uncertainty because it is different, of course, to the treatment naive prostate. Uh, and I suspect that uh, this will be snapped up by people incorporated in future studies for focal and even just in clinical practice. Um, so look, that's great. Thank you very much for bringing us these highlights. And thank you very much for dialing in from Mexico today. Uh, we look forward to welcoming you back down in Australia next year. And uh, I wish you all the best with your role at the National Cancer Institute in Mexico. Thank you very much, Declan, and congratulations for the podcast and thanks for having me today. You're very welcome. So that's all we have time for in this month's edition of the European Urology Podcast. I do hope that you enjoyed our content. Please do subscribe, rate, review us and all that sort of stuff. It makes it easier for other people to find the podcast. And if there's something in particular you'd like us to cover on this podcast, please do get in touch. Platinum at europeanurology.com or track us down through our social channels. We'll be back next month with some more great content from European Urology. Take care.